So, this is page 26 of the Evening Standard on Monday, the 23rd of February, 2009. Dozens of parents have complained to the BBC that a disabled television presenter is scaring their children. One father said he would ban his daughter from watching the channel because he thought it would give her nightmares. CBB's Bedtime Story. Have you ever listened to a seashell? My name is Kerry Bunnell. I'm a mother, writer and actor. But to some people, I will always be remembered as the woman on children's television with one hand. Others were like, oh, no, I, yeah, I mean, that arm, I feel the same. I mean, I don't mind disability, but I don't want to deal with it at 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, <laughs> sorry, we'll deal with it at 10 to 2. My little arm is, for want of a better word, a, you know, a deformity or a disfigurement. And, and it's that that is unnerving. But my experience isn't new. For hundreds of years, disabled people have been shut out of our society. We were made to feel we were superfluous to the world. You know, and that's a very hard message. <laughs> they wanted perfect people. Mm. They didn't want disabled people, they wanted us to be perfect. And all the treatments were to lead to that. At the end of the day, disability is largely feared. And you fear something that you do not know and do not understand. I want to explore a hidden story to discover how the attitudes of the past still shape the lives of people today and find out whether we can ever overcome centuries of injustice and fear. Prejudice towards disability is very rarely spoken of. This kind of, of whisper of, you know, well, it, it, it would have been better if you were able-bodied, or it would have been better if you weren't here at all. I didn't view myself as being disabled until I was in my late teens, early 20s. Because the word disability to me had always held such huge negative connotations. I thought disability meant vulnerability. I thought it meant that you were incapable of, of doing things independently. I certainly didn't think it was sexy or powerful. I was born in 1979 without the lower part of my right arm. But until I appeared on children's TV, I'd never personally been confronted by the prejudice that disabled people have faced throughout history. How is it possible these attitudes still exist in the 21st century? To understand where they come from, we have to look to the past and to a story most of us don't know. If you look back at our history, there was this whole idea, if you were disabled, you were disabled in every way. You were mentally disabled, physically disabled, morally disabled. They were all tied up. You were a lower form of life. The more disabled you looked, the more this was assumed of you. Southwell Workhouse in Nottinghamshire is one of the few surviving buildings like this left in the country. It's eerie and it's sort of haunting. There's a kind of merciless air to it. I can't imagine the desperation or the fear. These institutions were designed to be a last resort for the non-disabled poor. But it was in these places that our modern attitudes to disability were first formed. Idiocy, cripple, epilepsy, dropsical, weak mind, death and impediment in her speech, deformed. 
Before the Industrial Revolution, many disabled people could scrape a living or were looked after by their families. But as thousands flocked to the cities to work in the new factories, those unable to compete in this modern world were left behind. With nowhere else to go, the workhouses started filling with sick and disabled people. Aaron Pudney, deformed, incapable of earning his living. Mary Watson, infirm and being deformed. This is a parliamentary report into workhouses from 1861, listing everyone over the age of 16 in England and Wales who'd been an inmate of a workhouse for five years or more. And this is upwards of 60 years. I mean, one's been in there 70 years. Albertina Sammons, blind. Mary Kerridge, blindness. Robert Gepp, infirmity and... By 1900, the process of institutionalising disabled people had begun. Sophia Ransom, unsound mind. The whitewashed walls afford so many resting places for dust and the germs of disease. The beds are mostly straw. We saw a stream trickling from beneath one cot. The room had a strong odour of ammonia. A baby in a cradle was being tended by a deaf and dumb woman, and another infant was in the arms of an imbecile. I think it's very telling and also really appalling that both disability and poverty are so interlinked. And so that attitude of, you know, if you're poor, you're no good, or if you're disabled, you're no good. And it's a fear of mine that a shadow of that has, has carried on, really, so that we view poverty and disability in the same light almost today. If you've always been told that you are not deemed worthy of something, you know, it, it takes an awful lot to build up the fight and, and the courage to say, actually, yes, I am. By the early years of the 20th century, well-meaning reformers had begun to campaign for a more humane alternative to the workhouse. The Cheshire archives hold the story of one woman who was to create an institution that would affect the lives of tens of thousands of disabled people for decades. Mary Dendy was a social reformer. She was part of a large group of benefactors within the Manchester area who would look for causes like poverty or poor education, who would then look at how they could raise money to try and improve those. Dendy's radical vision was to lift disabled children out of poverty and give them a new life in a self-contained community where they would be shut away from society. It would be known as the Sandalbridge Colony. Years later, it would become the Mary Dendy Hospital, where Claire Moore's parents worked. This is actually a newspaper article. It does explain how she came across the young people that, that would end up living here. So Miss Dendy obtained from the Director of Education a complete list of the known defectives. That's the children, is it? Mm -hmm. And visited them. I found little children hidden away in rooms, only waiting until they should die. Gosh, OK, So she's horrifying. really seeing the impact of poverty. So she set up a home for the permanent care of the feeble-minded. And um, what constitutes feeble-minded? That term, once you look at the records, seems to um, be a, almost an umbrella term for yes. all sorts of disabilities. There are likely to be children with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, mm -hmm. but also, as we can see from some of the photographs, there are definitely children with physical disabilities as well. So... So the assumption was, if you were physically disabled, you were probably feeble-minded as well? That's likely to be the term used, yeah, because feeble-minded is used about 90% of the time <laughs> as, as the reason why that child has been admitted. Yes, the idea yeah. is that these young people will move into this permanent situation... And will be looked after. And will be looked after. This was something that was seen as um, a welcome, almost, really? solution. 
But there was no way out for them either, if it's permanent. That's right. <laughs> this is one of the admission books. This tells us about some of the very early children who were brought in to the Sandalbridge homes. This is written in Mary Dendy's own hand. So who's this? So this is uh, Sidney Humphreys, and he was born on the 10th of November, 1893. Um, and he was admitted eight years later. He's um, described as a big-headed boy oh. with weak limbs. Um, okay. It's indicated that he has had hydrocephalus, uh, water on the brain, which will have contributed to, mm, his to that. Difficulty. This young lady, this is Alice, Alice Crossley. She's described as a very nervous child. She is nearly blind. Now, you can see from this photograph, she has her hands up. So that yeah. I can see in the photograph there, that she has six fingers on each hand. I hadn't noticed that. So that is carefully noted as part of her disability. That, alongside her visual impairment, yes. obviously would, would have made her very vulnerable, you know, out in the community. Mm. Um, the she... mother applied for blind aid and for help so that she wouldn't have to put her out to beg. Yeah. So her mother's obviously... Her mother must have been absolutely desperate. He says that she's quite well and happy works in house and knits, wants to, to work, work in the in laundry, laundry, but impossible. Mm. Eyesight very bad, seems Certified. very stupid. I would really like to think that these, that these young people have lives beyond what was written on this page mm. here, because it's snapshot. Perhaps it's the only record of that young person's life. <laughs> In 2013, the Mental Deficiency Act gave authorities sweeping new powers to institutionalise people against their will. The effects of this policy to segregate and confine people who didn't fit are still being felt today. At a stroke of a pen, a doctor could sign your life away for the rest of your life. That was it. In 2007, a letter arrived at the family home of David Gamble. It was addressed to his mother, who had been dead for many years. The letter was from a residential care home where, unknown to David and his brother Kenneth, or the rest of their family, their sister Jean had been living. I got these letters. I was ready to just rip the thing up and throw away, but penciled in the top right hand corner. I seen uh, Jean Gamble. I remember that name as a kid, you know. So I rang her elder brothers and sisters. I said, we uh, got a uh, Jean Gamble, a sister, and like that. Yeah, she's your, your older sister. Oh, she must have passed, it, passed away years ago. I said, well, I've got a letter here. So about that. She's in some care home in Macclesfield. I rang the uh, Macclesfield up, I said, uh, have you got a, a girl there called uh, Jean Gamble? Oh, yes, yes, yes. A puddle now in the head, and she's very profoundly deaf. And uh, she's, uh, she reckons she's, she's got a family. And I don't, we don't think so, but we just put it down to her old age and that, you know. Well, I said, well, I, I happen to be a, be a brother. 70 years earlier, Jean Gamble was taken from her home in Birkenhead at the age of 15 sectioned under the Mental Deficiency Act. She had spent almost her entire life in institutions, including time in the Mary Dendy Hospital. When we seen her, I didn't know what to expect. Me and Alan, my brother, walked in here and she looked up at two of us and her eyes sparkled as if it was only yesterday. And she come running over and holding top of us, you know. I knew what. She knew our names, David and Alan. Such an emotional moment. And within, well, weeks, she died. She's just hanging on there to see as a family at last, long last. What else could be worse than be locked up for 70 years? She was denied all the things that, that could have happened, that she could have... Uh, been caught and she could have got married, she could have had children. All that was taken away from her. 
a lot of life, though she never existed. Well, she was older than me, so I didn't know she, the parents were a mental institution. I believe she, she was suffering from meningitis, that's why she was put away. Even to this day, we don't know for sure what she was put away for. I've got all kinds of letters here. And she was originally a section being a lunatic, a feeble mind. And my dad had to sign it, you know. He wouldn't even know what he's signing for, you know. But he thought maybe this is only a couple of months. But all knows him that she was there for the rest of her life. He wrote letters and letters to these homes. Is it possible for a release? But no, 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 no way. From birth to death, that's a whole story there. Jean Gamble was one of many thousands of disabled people who were permanently excluded from society under the Mental Deficiency Act. Among those who had campaigned hard to get the bill passed was Mary Dendy. I actually have an essay that Mary Dendy wrote. The experiment at Sandalbridge. So it's an experiment. This, this was revolutionary, what Mary was trying to achieve here. Yeah. Fortunately, the feeble-minded are much more easily made happy than sane persons. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Mary, if you say so. <laughs> it is perfectly easy to make the great majority of the weak-minded happy without ever letting them see anything of the outside world. Mm. Above all, I should like to emphasise the fact that it is easy to keep the feeble-minded children if they are never allowed once to indulge animal passions. So if they're never allowed to have sex. That is what Mary was explicitly Trying, um, to trying, stop. trying to prevent. She wanted to stop so in her mind. That's what this whole thing is about, actually. Yeah, absolutely. This is around segregation of men and women to stop reproduction through the generations. She set up this beautiful home with a very kind of noble idea, but actually, it's quite horrific that it's uh, l let's just stop them from breeding. And then what eventually we would all be filtered out? Yeah, this was really about looking to strengthen the human race, strengthen human so stock eugenics. by filtering out these so-called defects. You know, this was really quite a well-supported movement. Great figureheads like Winston Churchill, for example, Aldous Huxley, many other politicians, writers, you know, held this very same view. Um, that the world was better off without saving yeah, children. Yeah, and this in it. sort of environment that, that Mary is setting up is almost a solution to what they see as societal ills at the time. That is, it's just so shocking. It is, it is. Eugenics seeks to apply the known laws of heredity so as to prevent the degeneration of the race and improve its inborn quality. In the 1920s and 30s, scientists and politicians alike made use of Charles Darwin's ideas about selective breeding. Here is a man who, although normal, comes from a mentally defective family. Here is his wife, who is also normal. They have had 17 children. Seven of them are all mental defectives. Their aim was to use the new colonies like Sandalbridge to segregate disabled people, keeping them away from the strong and healthy. Two live at home, a man and a crippled dwarf girl. This film, made by the Eugenics Society in the 1930s, remains shocking and controversial nearly a century on. Once they have been born, defectives are happier and more useful in these institutions than when at large. If carefully trained, they can be taught simple routine tasks. But it would have been better by far for them and for the rest of the community if they had never been born. It's so horrific. Just that mentality of you were a mistake, you don't have a place in the world, it would have been better for everyone if, if you just didn't exist. I mean, it's really obvious to me that had I been born in this time, I would have just been viewed as a defective. I would have been seen as absolutely worthless. 
it's what Hitler was championing, really. You just take a, a thin slice of society away, slowly, 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 so no one notices. And then suddenly you turn around and you go, oh, well, where are the disabled people? Ideas about eugenics grew in popularity across the world during the 1930s, but it was in Germany that they were taken to their most extreme conclusion. Between 1933 and 1945, the Nazi regime carried out the mass sterilization of up to 400,000 disabled people with all kinds of impairments. Over a quarter of a million more were murdered. The discovery of these horrors ended Britain's public support for eugenics, but it didn't end the authorities still trying to control the lives of disabled people. Instead of shutting us away, the medical world now saw our disabled bodies as problems they needed to fix. You think you're on the scratchy, but the future holds something very different for these lads. Efforts to rehabilitate disabled people had begun after the First World War with wounded servicemen. They come in on crutches, and it's Rohampton's job to send them out under their own steam, ready to pick up their lives where they were interrupted. But by the 1940s, doctors had turned their attention to civilians. What an absolute pleasure to meet you. Anne McFarlane was born in 1939. At a young age, she had developed a condition called Stills disease, which caused her joints to swell and stiffen. They wanted perfect people. Mm. They didn't want disabled people. They wanted us to be perfect, which was, I think, why I, I experienced the torment of trying to be perfect. And all the treatments were to lead to that. So it's really the medical the, idea yes, the that medical, you have to yes. be able-bodied. That's yes, the goal. Yes, absolutely. Look at these happy, healthy children. What a contrast to this little girl who is walking for the very first time in her life. By the time I was four years old, I was so ill that I went into hospital. They could see that my knees were bending up and I couldn't mm. straighten them. My arms were beginning to bend, my fingers. So they decided to break my legs and put me in plaster. This is when you were four? Yes. So that was quite a prolonged affair. So every time you had your legs broken and reset, they would heal. Yes. And then the same um, issues would persist. That's right. And they would break them again. Yes. For the sake of being made perfect, Anne spent virtually her entire childhood in and out of hospitals. When I was nine, they didn't really know what to do. So they decided that I needed complete rest. So they made okay. a, what they called a plaster bed, a sort of <laughs> a statuette of your whole body, oh and told me to shut up and throw a bucket of water over my head if I didn't stop screaming, because they had to get the legs as straight as they could to lay in this plaster bed. So you were just trapped, really? Oh, yes, you were strapped down. You were strapped onto it. You couldn't move. And then you had a mirror. You can't quite see the mirror in the picture, but there was a mirror over the bed so you could try and turn it to see what was going on around you. And how did you feel being in this plaster bed? Well, at first it was actually terrible um, because it was so painful and uncomfortable. But as I got used to it, it was fine. And do you get used to it? Because I remember having a plaster cast just on this arm. It's yeah. one, one limb, you know, and, yeah. and absolutely screamed. But yes. no-one threw water over me and no-one told me to shut up. Sometimes it's very difficult for me to think back to that childhood, mm -hmm. the pain, the fear. The fear, I think, was paramount. People often say, poor old so-and-so has to go into hospital, as if a hospital were the most dreadful place. Look how happy these children are. Everything I can ever think of was all to make me more perfect. <laughs> Look what I've ended up like. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we're conditioned right from the beginning to think that we're not right, we're the problem, yes. we have to change oh, to fit in. Yes, definitely. You're a nuisance, you're a burden. You were seen as nothing, really, as a disabled person. I mean, what good were you, you know? Well, plenty of bloody good, but no yes, one, but no one sees that. Yes, nobody recognised it, yes. What Anne went through happened more than 30 years before I was even born. And yet, when I was growing up, doctors did their best to make me perfect too. Roehampton was the hospital that had the prosthetics unit I used to go to. And I remember, you know, walking along corridors and looking up and just seeing, like, hundreds and hundreds of prosthetic legs just kind of hanging there, just, just waiting. The people in the white coats, the people with the power, some of them had very firm ideas. There was never a choice as to whether I could have the prosthetic or not. There was a hook that was literally like this, kind of covered in plastic, and the idea was that it would open and close and you'd be able to pick things up. I mean, do you think it worked? No. There was one called the My Electric Hand, and this was like, you know, cutting-edge technology, so it would open like... And everyone was really excited about this. Not me, everyone else. I then went back to just having just a regular prosthetic that was like a doll's hand that didn't do anything. And I, I said to a doctor, you know, I just, I just don't want it, I just don't want to wear it. And he said, well, you know, the other children might not like it if you don't wear it, or you might not have any friends. Saying that to a six or seven year old is, is so poisonously ableist. And I don't think it was particular to him, that was just the attitude at the time. It was such a quiet victory when I finally didn't have to wear it. But I'd never have been allowed the freedom to choose were it not for one man who, in the 1940s, began to change our prejudices about disabled people. If he can get the proper treatment from the start, these people can become once again, in spite of their uh, severe disability, useful members of society. One of the extraordinary things about Dr Ludwig Gutmann, a Jewish neurologist, is that he came to Britain to escape the Nazi regime in Germany, the very same regime that was determined to wipe out disabled people. He's like a father to these patients. He treats them like sons and daughters sometimes. In 1944, he opened Britain's first specialist unit for the treatment of spinal injuries at the Stoke Mandeville Hospital. It's no good to, to be just what, what's called kind. You can kill people with kindness. You have sometimes to be firm. Paraplegia is not the end of the way. It is the beginning of a new life. Gutmann had a brilliantly simple idea, to use competitive sport to give disabled people the chance to succeed. We started with simple games first, darts playing in the ward, uh, and we had a, a, a billiard and a snooker. And then I saw, of course, uh, how these men react, not only physically, but psychologically. They suddenly felt, you see, they they can do something. I've come to North Yorkshire to meet a woman who spent nine months under Dr. Gutman's care. She adjusted herself to her disability in the most marvellous way, with her determination, with her courage, and with a good sense of humour. In 1958, Lady Susan Massam was paralysed from the waist down in a riding accident when her horse fell and rolled onto her. This was me riding in a point-to-point. -point. That was before my accident. Yeah. And yet two years later, she competed for Britain in what would become known as the first International Paralympics in Rome. Oh, this is the opening ceremony. So all the different so countries, I was one of those. Oh, it was a completely 
pioneering new adventure, really. And it was the first, so we were all guinea pigs, really. <laughs> Did you feel a sense of belonging when you were there? Yes, I think so. Because it's yes, must have it been... was a movement. Yeah. Yes, and it was an amazing organisation. It looks bringing it. all these different people who are paralysed together. And whose idea was this? It was Gutman. It was called Papa. <laughs> Papa Gutman. <laughs> he was a remarkable man. He thought that if people could compete in sport, they could compete in everyday work. Psychologically, that was his ethos. Yes. And at the beginning, people used to come around and say, oh, you know, what are you going to do with all these cripples? And he said, oh, they'll get back to work. They're going to be taxpayers. He was determined that his patients would achieve something. The men and women who competed in Rome not only became international heroes... That's me. ..but showed the world we are all more than our disability. There you are. <laughs> That's a gold medal. So you got gold? I got gold, yeah. That's amazing. I got a gold, a silver and a bronze. We went to dinner with a friend at a restaurant by the Trivi Fountain and I lost my gold medal. You lost it? I lost it. They said I'd thrown it in the Trivi Fountain. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't. I you think just... it dropped out of my wheelchair. That did did they give you another one? No, I tried. Oh. <laughs> no. But somewhere, somewhere in Rome, there it's is somewhere in Rome. Medal. I left my heart in Rome. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Susan returned from Rome, having won bronze, silver, and gold medals, and went on to compete in the '64 and '68 Paralympics. You know, Gutman was very keen for us to pass on his philosophy. He wanted us to be his ambassadors. Do you think that this inspired you to then get involved with things in the early stages? I think it did, and it opened my eyes to the need for the general public to understand disability better. Mm. Today, there are more than 5,000 para-athletes globally who compete in games throughout the world reaching an audience of billions. In the early days, we were very much amateurs in a way, and now the games have become much more professional. Intense. But maybe they're not quite so fun. <laughs> it's remarkable that one man influenced the public's attitude toward disability so profoundly. By seeing what was possible, if you look beyond the disability, he proved to all of Britain that every individual had worth. That's an extraordinary legacy to leave behind. But for most disabled people across Britain, Gutman's sports movement would take years to change attitudes. Thousands of people without family to care for them or the financial means to live at home remained hidden away in institutions. Do you feel very shut off in here? Well, I do, rather. Mm. It can't be helped. Mm. It took one man who was living in a residential home in Hampshire, to change the rules. When did you start to get to know Paul Hunt? How did that happen? I was curious about this man, because he was so highly thought of by the residents. Judy Hunt met Paul while working at Lee Court, the home where he lived. Quite often I was helping out at a table which Paul was on, so I got to sort of know him a bit, I mean, and hear, hear him talking, and he was quite a witty chap, you know. He was a reader, writer, right from the start. It was looking at the situation of disabled people to liberate themselves. I have long, strong memories of hours spent in the wheelchair store. 
Oh, well, what were you doing in the wheelchair? There store? was a shortage of spaces to just sit and have quiet conversations because people would share bedrooms. Mm. I think I, I was in awe of him, actually. In 1970, Paul and Judy decided to marry and move to London, where Paul soon realised the prejudice he had lived with in institutions existed in the outside world as well. Right, on this page, there's a letter by Paul Hunt. Two years after arriving in London, he wrote a letter to a national newspaper calling for disabled people to come together and end their enforced segregation. Every sentence in her article could apply with equal force to the severely physically handicapped, many of whom also find themselves in isolated and unsuitable institutions where their views are ignored and they are subject to authoritarian and often cruel regimes. I am proposing the formation of a consumer group to put forward nationally the views of actual and potential residents of these successors of the workhouse. I should be glad to hear from anyone who is interested to join or support this project. Yours faithfully, Paul Hunt. That's just amazing. I don't think anyone would have put into words so sublimely and so beautifully the struggle and, and the call to arms, really. Yeah. Paul's letter galvanised people across the country. No government, present or future, will give us what we demand unless we shame them into action. And as disabled people began to voice their outrage, they drew up a blueprint for their future. He says, in our view, it is society which disables physically impaired people. Disability is something imposed on top of our impairments by the way we are unnecessarily isolated and excluded from full participation in society. Mm -hmm. Disabled people are therefore an oppressed group in society. And what they've been struggling with for quite a long time was saying, is not us who should be accepting mm. our, our disability. We shouldn't be accepting our disability. We have to eliminate our disability mm. by changing the environment. And it just, open people's eyes enormously. It's the first time that anyone has said, it's not you, you're not the disability, you're not the problem, it's the world and yes. the way that you're viewed. That's right, and if it's the world, you can change that. Mm -hmm. So when I was around 20, uh, when I was at drama school, they suddenly, halfway through my second year, decided that I was a disabled actor instead of being an actor. <laughs> Why? I don't know. But all of a sudden, there was this, this big push to make me wear a prosthetic hand on stage. And the idea was that I would go forth, thither into the world, and wear a prosthetic and become Kate Winslet or something. I was definitely there for the Kate Winslet part, definitely wasn't there for the prosthetic part. And that's when I really started feeling some deep shit in my self-esteem because, again, it was like this, we, you know, you're not good enough as you are. And so this is when I started learning about the fact that there was a social model of disability and that, you know, you, the individual, shouldn't have to conform to society. Society should bloody well change for you. When I broke my neck, I went into this institution. I had that feeling, a very definite feeling, that I'm not going to spend the rest of my life here with 49, 50 other disabled people just because I'm dis... Home, in the true sense of the word, exactly as you and I mean home, not an institution. Even though Lee Court was a lot more progressive, there was no integration, no inclusion in the local communities. And I think that's not, to me anyway, part of what life should be. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't rich, which would have been another way I could have paid for people to work for me. But at 25, I had no option. I had to go there, you know. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a choice. John was determined his life wouldn't be spent locked away. 
Influenced by the emerging disability movement, he set about finding an alternative way of living outside of an institution or residential home. Project 81 was like a dream or a vision about living in the community. I was pioneering, I suppose, for my freedom. And within that, it was the freedom for other disabled people. So, you know, there's a real buzz about something that could happen. Then you got a sense of a movement growing, because that was what was going to liberate us. The main thing was, was trying to get the idea that we just wanted to live in our own homes, in ordinary streets with ordinary people. And also, we wanted to ensure that we were involved in all decisions that were made about our lives. Because until then, all decisions were made by social care or health care professionals. Up and down the country, people called on the authorities to give them the money that would enable them to live independently. In 1983, John was one of the very first to move from a residential home into a place of his own. It's just indescribable, I think, the feeling after living in a home with disabled people for almost four and a half years. Then suddenly I've got my own place. It's, uh, yeah, it was astonishing for days. Couldn't sleep because I was just buzzing all over and just so excited. Don't pull my arm off again, will you? No, right, I won't. Handle me gently. And now, you know, 45 years later, you know, I, I look back and, and think, my goodness, in some respects, becoming totally paralyzed was one of the best things that happened to me because it enabled me to be a central figure in, in developing the disability movement. Our strength is that we are united and we know what the problem is. And by coming together, we are going to change that. I would have been four when John and others were winning their freedom. But the world they found outside of the institutions was anything but welcoming. What you got? We want what you got. We want what you got. All we want is to be able to get on the bus the same as every other member of the public. You want to get on the bus? Get on the bus. How? This is just like one in front. How? We were angry. We wanted to get on public transports, and we wanted to be free. So we decided that we would become freedom fighters. And that's when we started breaking the law. We are here. We are not going to go away and fight of anything. We are going to gain in strength. Nearly 40 years ago, Baroness Jane Campbell and Alia Hassan took to the streets fighting for their rights. It was the moment that we suddenly felt proud of who we were. Yeah. It was yes. a bit like black power. Yeah. We were then proud to be disabled people. Freedom on the right to transport. It's public transport. It would be public, and we're members of the public too. The interesting thing is, is I went from feeling totally powerless yes. to bringing London to a standstill, mm. and that is actually very yeah, powerful. Amazing. In Whitehall, direct action by the disabled, action that stopped the traffic. Their demand, equal civil rights. And it's like, actually, we're not powerless. No. We can be visible, we can be heard. The protesters here say demonstrations like this today are designed to force the government to take notice of the views of people with disabilities. I want to be able to go nightclubbing, I want to go to restaurants, I want to go to the cinema without being a virus. I'm afraid you're under arrest for obstructing the highway because you're refusing to get out of the way of these vehicles. We just didn't have anything, no buses. They trained, you sat in the, in the guards' van with the pigeons and the post and the freezing cold. There was nothing. And the worst thing is, at dress shirts, we don't have people like you in here. Oh, yes, I've been thrown that, out. That, yeah. was, that was the worst. It's like, no blacks, no dogs, no, dis yeah. no disabled people. Live from the Television Centre in London, a host of distinguished guests are arriving for a night of fun and surprises. Children in Need, 1990. I'm out here demonstrating because no one ever asks disabled people what they think of events like children in need and telethon. But for Jane and Alia, it wasn't enough to just fight the physical barriers. 
they wanted to challenge the most deep-seated belief that disabled people are people to pity. We hate charity, yeah, we don't we? Do. And that's very controversial. They have the money by portraying us as poor, pathetic creatures that need money. Okay. And that, for us, is another indication that we haven't got a voice. We have one very important saying in the disability world. It's called nothing about us without us. And that means if you're not employing at least half of us to work in your charity, then you are not speaking on our behalf. Until able-bodied people take responsibility for stopping the continuation of our oppression, we will always be fighting. Michael Tell me about the telephones. How did that come about? We heard that there was going to be a big charity fundraiser called Telephone. Yes. And it was big. <laughs> they were going to get all the big celebrities down there. And what was the aim? To raise money for the charities. So the right. charities could help us poor disabled people. And we decided we would go down there and pick at it. And we called the demo Block Telethon out Piss on Pity. Yeah. <laughs> piss on Pity. <laughs> All those people in the building opposite are begging on our behalf. Let's roll the scoreboard, see the running total, let's see it. We want to tell you, you don't have our permission. We went down there and we literally blocked the entire studios. You can't afford to ignore disabled people any longer. We don't want your patronage. What we want is your support for our equal rights as disabled people campaigning against segregation. And there's this wonderful shot of Chris Tarrant. He was absolutely He's living. enraged, yeah, he wasn't was. he? It's an amazing event. People come from all over the country. They've worked for 27 hours non-stop, and it raises huge amounts of money. I mean, are you saying that everybody disabled in this country doesn't want to know about the money that telethons raise? Because I don't believe that. In 1992, ITV aired its last telethon on behalf of disabled people. The telethon protests had made their mark. Now you have the choice about the way that you give. You can choose to continue to, feel, to, to portray us as helpless, deserving crips. Or you can see us as people involved in the civil rights struggle. In 1995, after 15 years of direct action by disabled people, the government took the first step towards giving us equal rights with the passing of the Disability Discrimination Act. My bill is concerned with outlawing discrimination against disabled people. If you read this bill, it is not a PR exercise. If that sort of a bill had gone through for black people or women, there would be utter outrage, utter outrage. But many people thought the legislation fell short of true equality. We know that we deserve much better. We know that we deserve proper human civil rights. Totally, totally. What you gonna do? The fight continued until eventually in 2010, the government passed the Equality Act, which went further than ever before to protect our rights. We did it. We did really <laughs> good. We did it really well. We were kind of 20, 20th century suffragettes. We were becoming liberated disabled women. And that is, that is so exciting. incredibly mm -hmm. intoxicating. Yes. We've fought for these changes that have happened and enable us to live independently, live the life we want, not just surviving. But a lot of young people, they don't know their history. They know those of us who did know how, you know, how hard that struggle was at times just to make things happen. The 
law has given us rights, but they don't necessarily change the way society views us. Those attitudes won't change with the passing of a bill. I don't think anybody that's grown up in a segregated situation ever gets over it. I don't think you, you can, because you, it's the norm. It's what's normal to you when you're a child. And then everything after that is a struggle to try and create something better. Michelin Mason was born with a condition commonly known as brittle bones disease. Growing up, her impairment meant she was denied a place at a mainstream school. I used to dream of going to school. The reason I wasn't there was nothing to do with anything that was about my needs. And I, and I knew that very early and felt very angry about it. When her daughter Lucy was born with the same condition in 1984, Michelin was determined her future was going to be very different. My overriding thought I had when Lucy was born was that she was entitled to everything in the world that everybody else is, just by being alive in this world. I think my dream was that disabled people would educate the able-bodied world in education about how we could live together. And that the children would have a big role in that, because children are much better at inclusion than adults. But the fight Michelin had in front of her was to get Lucy into a mainstream school at a time when tens of thousands of disabled children continued to be segregated. This is what's called a special school. There are no non-disabled children here. The advocates of special schools too easily claim that disabled children can prosper only in this environment. I've always been very aware that if my mum hadn't done the work that she did, my life just would have looked so different. I probably wouldn't have gone to a mainstream school. We are education. The gates of Downing Street under siege campaign groups for the disabled, demanding that all children should be taught in the same schools, whatever their physical or mental impairment. With them, 14-year-old Lucy, who attends a mainstream comprehensive. Everybody and disabled young people decided that they're fed up being separated in a different school system. Because there is actual law at the moment that says that it's up to the like, different education authorities to decide where disabled children go to school so they can force them to go to special schools against their will. I discovered locally um, this group called the Parents' Campaign for Integrated Education. And it was almost entirely parents of children with Down syndrome. Their children were pioneers of inclu inclusive education because they were willing to take on this particular battle and make it work. I've never met parents that were that committed and that brave. Together, they took on the education authorities and proved inclusive education could work. The real meaning of inclusion became sort of obvious after a while. And when people saw the non-disabled kids saying, we want our friend in school with us, we have a lot of fun together, you know. That, in a way, is what changes people. You almost can't argue about it anymore. I was often told I was the, you know, the definition of inclusion working. Because of the fact that I was one of the first kids to go into mainstream school. I find it quite hard to believe we achieved it, to be honest. But, you know, it's a human right. It's a in shrined in international human rights law, like, that was a massive thing. But to go from a porter cabin in South London, you and some of your mates, to a bit of international law that is there for everybody in the world, that's like, that isn't no achievement. I think you just have to... <laughs> I think it's Boris always Johnson's hard. It's very nice to hear you say it. <laughs> it's always hard when it's yourself, isn't it? Today, the world my daughter is growing up in is undeniably different. 
it was prejudice that segregated us into institutions. It was a fear of difference that made doctors try and fix us. And it was discrimination that shut us out. And after more than a hundred years, we're still not there yet. The clock is being turned backwards and has been turned backwards 10 years ago. You know, that's, we're almost firefighting now to try and, and keep what, what little we have. We've had some major years of austerity. Mm. Who have been the hardest hit? Who are the people who are now living more in poverty, disabled people? Who was the hardest hit throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? Disabled people. We have to fight every, every threat to our freedom, you know? Because that's what it is, it is a threat to our freedom to live the lives we, we, we live. But I mean, I'm an optimist and just feel that, you know, we've got to keep going. And, you know, we've got to make sure they don't disappear. So what's the fight that we have today? We look at the huge achievement, uh, all, all of the rights that have undoubtedly been won. That's where we have to remain vigilant, really, to make sure that those rights aren't suddenly taken away in the middle of the night when no one is looking. A bill in Parliament can just be changed and, and all of a sudden, all of that funding or all of that freedom or all of that access is just suddenly gone. And so then what you get is a narrowing and a narrowing and a narrowing of, of life and experience as a disabled person until you, you have nothing. We're in a very bad place at the moment. However, I can't believe it will last. I suppose my, my belief is inclusion is something everybody wants in their hearts. I've always said it. And um, who wouldn't want that as a future, you know? So I'm hoping this is the dark before the dawn. I really am. <laughs>